Kristalin is one of the only living people who has connections into the Bilderberg Group. I get some intel from people on the periphery, but I do not have a source directly inside Bilderberg. But much of what they would cover at Bilderberg previously in secret is now rolled out publicly at Davos each year. Daniel Estelin has written several international bestsellers on the Bilderberg Group. He's also written a thinly veiled fiction uh, that, of course, really isn't fiction at a lot of levels. Just like Ian Fleming's James Bond novels uh, were true stories put into a composite. And he now has released a documentary we're going to be telling you about today. Uh, he joins us uh, till 30 after, longer if he'd like. He's an author, public speaker, DanielEstelin.com, E-S-T-U-L-I-N.com. And his latest book is The Octopus Deception. And he joins us uh, now to break down world government. We've gone from 15 years ago, mainstream media said it didn't exist. Now global government's here. Presidents in, in Italy are appointed because they're Goldman Sachs presidents. Uh, we see leaders appointed in other countries. We are now going into the technocratic era. Uh, that, of course, is a statement out of Bilderberg six, seven years ago and from Davos last year. So really, they're coming out in the open. They're dissolving borders. They're passing global treaties without ratification. The text of the treaties are secret. Things are moving into high gear and at the bottom of the rat hole is transhumanism. And Daniel will break that down. I want to look at the conflict with Russia. I want to look at what's happening in Europe, what's happening in Greece, uh, standing up to Germany, at least on the surface. Daniel Estelin joins us via video Skype uh, to give us uh, a rundown on the latest unfolding worldwide. Uh, he also published his second book, released in 2006, uh, described by Fidel Castro as a fantastic story. Castro wanted to meet him, so he went to Cuba to meet him. Estelin is not a communist, by the way, but it is, I'd meet with Castro if I wanted to meet with him. The point is he's, he's very influential uh, because his analysis is cutting edge. And I happen to know who one of his Bilderberg sources is, by the way, uh, through Hollywood connections. I'll just leave it at that. So I know Estelin's for real, and his intel continues to, to, to come out and to be accurate year after year. So he's got the big scoop on where it may be held this year. Uh, is it accurate, as some are saying, that it's going to be in Austria? Uh, and a lot more. Daniel, thank you for joining us. Alex, it's always a great, enormous pleasure for me to be on your show. You and I go way back. Uh, in 2006, uh, we had uh, together, standing right in front of the Bilderberg Hotel in Canada, Ottawa, uh, when you were arrested, if you remember, of course you remember, Yes. just before you came to Canada. And uh, so we've been doing this for a long, long time. And of course, uh, Jim Tucker was with us. He's no longer with us. But uh, there's a lot of people out there who are doing what they can to make sure that this story doesn't die. And again, this global awareness, which we were talking about before, on the world stage, people are becoming aware more and more what's going on as a result of technological revolution, internet and everything else out there. It's getting more and more difficult for the global elite to hide their deeds. And as you said, we do have the sources. And I'm very glad you didn't actually give out the source we have through Hollywood because these are some very, very influential and useful people for our cause. Well, sure. I mean, of course, I'm not going to get into it, but I wasn't giving out a secret for those that know. But, no, but I know. sure, but and that's just one of your sources. But I'm just confirming that uh, that you know, some inside baseball for folks out there that know what we're talking about. Uh, Daniel, continuing uh, looking at what's happening, why do you think they're coming so out in the open? And then you've got the floor because I could ask questions, but I want to know what's on your mind, the latest intel you've gotten. Well, the Bilderberg meeting is being held actually in 2015 in, in Austria on my Twitter account, at Estrell and Daniel. I published a couple of months ago a, uh, an information, a report that I got from my intel sources in the Ministry of the Interior of Austria who sent me the report saying which dates that everybody in Austria has to be on the lookout. There is no holidays that week. I believe it's from the 9th of the, I can't remember exactly the date right now, but it's the beginning of June and it is being held in Austria and we have the documents to demonstrate it. As far as what's going on in the world, the globalist elite, the reason that actually all this information is coming out right now, Alex, is that the globalist elite are faced with the reality 
of seeking to dominate populations that are increasingly becoming self-aware and are developing a global consciousness. Thus, a population being subjected to domination in Africa, for example, has the ability to become aware of a population being subjected to the same forms of domination in the Middle East, in South America, or in Asia, or even in Europe, in Greece, for example. And they can recognize that they're all being dominated by the same global power structures. And that is the key point. Not only is the awakening global in its reach, but also in its nature. It creates within the individual an awareness of the global condition. So it is a global awakening, both in the external environment and also in the internal psychology. And this is something that the elitists, such as the Bilderbergers, the Trilateral Commission, Council for Relations, Penai Circle, Bohemian Grove, all this, you know, in, 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 ONGs, Rockefeller Foundations, Carnegie's, every, you know, Hudson's and, and Hoover's, they simply, you know, can't deal with it right now because it's a new game. And this new reality in the world comes with the fact, Alex, that the world's population has never been so vast, presents a challenge to elites seeking to dominate people all over the world who are aware and awakened to the realities of social inequality, to war, poverty, exploitation, disrespect, imperialism, and domination. And of course, this directly implies that these populations will be significantly more challenging to control, both economically, politically, socially, psychologically, and also spiritually. Simply amazing. You know, you when I interviewed you for Endgame uh, eight, nine years ago, you talked about at the bottom of the rabbit hole is eugenics, is transhumanism, that they don't need human populations anymore in large numbers. The decision has been made not to build a world where humans go to space and where we have human dignity, but where humans don't have dignity so that we expect uh, to be basically reclamated, uh, destroyed, phased out. What's the latest intel in that area? What's the latest th that happened behind the scenes at Davos? And what's going to be on the agenda, if you know so far, uh, at the coming meeting in a few months uh, there in Austria? Well, I think, you know, as we've talked about, uh, um, I think it was six or seven months ago, my last book in the United States is actually called Trans Evolution, The Coming Age of Human Deconstruction. And in that book, basically, I explain and you know, you've been following this and you've been talking about this, I think, longer than anybody in the world. You brought this to people's attention long before I decided to write this book, Trans Evolution, that, you know, we're living through this greatest paradigm change in the history of the human, you know, planet Earth, of human society. And the changes we're seeing right now over the very short period of time into the future, you know, are so paramount that they will forever change the very face of humanity. For example, those of us who have children who today are six, seven, eight years old, you know, this is, you could pretty much safely say that this is the last 100% human generation of people on the planet Earth. Our grandchildren, they will not be human. They'll be transhuman, they'll be post-human, they'll be man-machines, they'll be cyborgs, they'll be beings who are not totally human as a result of incredible revolution in synthetic biology. So again, we are seeing this change from human to transhuman to post-human, and this change is gonna lead to a completely different state of a human being into the very near future. And again, we're talking about progress and technological development, which the elite are using for their own advantage, because again, the point is, if using technology to increase the power of men over nature, that's an amazing thing. It's a positive thing. But if you're using technology to subjugate us a lot more than we already are subjugated, because there's a lot more people, it's a small planet with limited natural resources. So you have, you know, 1% against 99% and for the Rockefellers of this world to eat, most of us have to die. I mean, you've talked about this ad nauseum in your documentaries. And I was honored, actually, to participate in one of them. Well, we were honored to have you, Daniel. We're going to talk about your documentary here in a moment and skip this network break because all the time we have with you is so precious. But expanding on that, the way you quantify it in your latest book, which was just excellent research and material, I learned a lot uh, reading it, is we've got to put that out there, that that's the choice. They're building a world to get rid of us where we don't exist. That's the global architecture. That's what the social engineers are going for now. 50 years ago, there was a debate about it. Now that group has taken control. That's why things are moving so quickly. People need to know the future of our world has been decided if we let these people 
run things. But if the population is aware of their program, then all of this deindustrialization, all of this dehumanization will then make perfect sense and we can stop it. I mean, Daniel, I don't see how they can get their program if you and I and countless others are exposing it. And like you said, 20 years ago, no one was talking about this. Now, th this is becoming very, very mainstream, and I don't see how they're going to sell the idea of something so monstrous. Well, you know, a great example, and I think, you know, the greatest living example is Detroit. I mean, if you want to talk about deindustrialization, zero growth, demand destruction, all you need to do is look at Detroit. This was the, you know, the engine of economic growth and industrial might in the United States for the past half a century. Today, it looks like something you see in a Will Smith, you know, zombie post-apocalyptic film. And of course, people who live in the United States, who live in Detroit, who live in Michigan, or who live, you know, anywhere, and who are aware of what's going on in Detroit, have to understand that this is a prototype for the globalist elite for the rest of the world. They want the rest of the world, and you've talked about this, I think, again, longer than anybody I know, they want the rest of the world to look like Detroit. London to look like Detroit, Paris to look like Detroit, you know, Moscow to look like Detroit. And if you kind of look at Europe, I mean, Greece already looks like Detroit. Portugal looks like Detroit. In Spain, you have 70% youth under 30 unemployed. Italy, you know, is up in arms. Half of the country, you know, from Rome down is pretty much unemployed. Anywhere you go, you know, the world is up in arms. South America, Southeast Asia, you know, Canada, uh, you know, Africa, you know, these places, this is what deindustrialization looks like. And again, if people are wondering why the elite are doing this, progress and development is directly proportional to population density. So if you have progress, you have technological you know, development and industrial development, you're gonna have more wealth, more money, greater families, which means you're gonna have more mouths to feed. And so for the Rockefellers of this world to eat, you know, we have to die. It's really that simple. There's simply not enough food. There's enough space for now. But there's not enough food. So which is why on the one hand what they're doing, and I talk about this in trans evolution, and you pointed out to me very well, this is exactly what they're doing. On the one hand, they're destroying the world's economy on purpose, the elite. But on the other hand, they're using their gazillions of their monies to actually invest in this incredible futuristic technology, which will make this divide between their power over the rest of humanity greater than ever. By the way, we're rolling some background footage of your new film, and I tell you, it looks like better than something you'd see on HBO. Uh, the camera work, the research, I cannot wait to see this. Tell us about your new documentary, Daniel, and uh, how soon we can get a copy of it. I'd love to sell it on DVD or Blu-ray once it comes out at my store, but um, I hope it goes in theaters first. Uh, tell people the name. Tell us all about this incredible uh, documentary on the Bilderberg Group that you've produced. Well, we actually, we're, we're in a post-production now. The film comes out at the end of May, beginning of June. We've been at it for about four years. It's our production. We've gone down interviews in 11 countries, Canada, the United States, most of Europe. We've traveled up and down all over the place. The first producer of the documentary was actually wiped out economically, if you believe in conspiracy or coincidence theories, won three banks called in loans on the same day and basically bankrupted him. So we actually- And by the way, I, I separately know about this, not from you, but, but I know who the group was. Are we allowed to say who they were or we shouldn't talk about it? You can if you want, exactly. Was that the guys with the uh, Halcyon group? No, no, no. The Halcyon group, that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the, uh, the uh, major motion uh, picture. Yeah, that's the folks that made Terminator, then they also came after them and took them over to stop your exactly. film getting made, right? Uh, yeah, no, these are not the people who are producing the, uh, the documentary. These are other people in Spain, independent producers, people who... So this has happened twice, then, if I'm correct. This happened twice, once with the motion motion picture, and now with the documentary, which is why it took us a bit longer. But it's wow. almost with the post-production stages. I tell you a little anecdote. I sent a letter, an email to uh, uh, Martin Wolf, the Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist with the Financial Poll Times, and I asked him for an interview, and I got a reply, and of course, we're gonna put it in the, uh, the documentary. He said in the email, how dare you make a documentary about the Bilderberg Group? So the documentary is coming out of the beginning of, of June, end of May. We're in the post-production, and you know, we're very, very close to the finish line. We're gonna be over that finish line and the film is gonna be out worldwide release. There's a lot of international large film festivals who are very interested. And also Bilderberg, 
has become a household name. The book came out 10 years ago, and now everybody knows about it. And I think this is the time. It's the right time, socially speaking, with all the changes taking place in the world, that people think finally are ready to embrace this concept that you've been talking about for about over a decade. And, you know, I've been talking about it for over a decade. Well, you've got yeah, Nigel you've Farage in here. You've got uh, just an amazing list of top people uh, in your film. I cannot wait to see this. What, what's the name of the film? It's called The True Story of the Bilderberg Group. It's based, obviously, on my book. It's actually the first documentary which is based on a book. Most documentaries, you know, are not based on books. But this one is based on my book, The True Story of the Bilderberg Group. I get it's going to be out in theaters end of May, beginning of June. And uh, when it's out, needless to say, I'd be more than, more than happy and pleased to go back on your show and talk about it. Incredible. Well, I'm thinking about going to Austria. I'll just give them a heads up like I did in England. They had... Uh, British intelligence domestically there waiting for me when I got off the plane to have a little talk with me and then I had to meet with the local multi-county group, uh, but they ended up being pretty nice and helping us out and ended up not liking the Bilderberg group too much, but I am going to give the Germans and the Austrians a heads up that I'm uh, coming. I know it's two different countries, but uh, the two work closely together. I wonder what reception I'll get uh, in Austria. How do you expect them to treat the press, Daniel? Uh, not very really well. It's, uh, you know, if you talk about Jack Bull, this is you know, the epitome of Jack, but Austria, Germany, and Switzerland. I mean, you pretty much, you know, these are, if you want to talk about, you know, Soviet glut, this is the European, uh, you know, uh, 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 German, Austrian, Swiss version of the Soviet gulag, modified, and needless to say. Sure, well, you live over there, and you lived in Russia, and, and Spain, and everywhere else, and, and Canada, so I know you're internationally, you know, uh, traveled, so I don't know. I haven't been to Austria yet. I know it's kind of a paradox, though, because the British ended up really hating Bilderberg and agreeing with me, the police, off record. And, I mean, a bunch of them. Uh, and uh, you had police buying me beer and stuff when, when they would you know, see me at the pub down the street getting dinner. Uh, so that was pretty amazing. And then when we had our reporters in Switzerland a few years ago, at first the police were real mean, but later... They were escorting members of the of the local canton into the meeting, getting in the face of Bilderberg, and they panicked and had jet copters taking off at night, which I know you know about. So, 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 what do you make of kind of this awakening, even by local government, to Bilderberg? Well, you know, I can tell you that in 2011, Mario Borghesio was European parliamentarian. He was actually punched out by the uh, by the uh, Swiss police, and he spent a couple of nights in a hospital. Right, he's suing him. Yeah, this is exactly. This is a member of the European Parliament, and then uh, uh, you know I had to explain to Mario Borghesio. I said, Mario, Switzerland is not Europe. Switzerland is Switzerland. It's like another planet. It has nothing to do with Europe. So him coming in with his European uh, member of the European Parliament uh, uh, pass makes an absolutely no difference because it's literally like walking into a you know closed up gulag. And Austria, I fear, is going to be pretty much the same thing. It's a small country. It's a peep squeak nation. And needless to say, you know, they have unresolved childhood issues, which they haven't been able to deal with since the Hitlerite days. Are you going to be there? I'm certainly going to try. You know, it all depends on the documentary. If it comes out, I may not be able to maybe promoting the film. But if I'm not, I'm certainly going to be there. If you're interested, after the interview, I'm going to send you the documents I received from my sources. You're more than welcome to post them on your site from the, uh, the Ministry of the Interior of Austrian uh, Secret Service explaining about the Bilderberg community to the people in the, uh, in the ministry uh, so that they're aware which days they can and cannot take off, you know, leaves of absence. Incredible. Well, I can't wait to see your film. It just looks like a smash hit. And, you know, Snowden's new film, Citizen Four, won an Oscar for Best Documentary. That's why they're so scared and said, how dare you? They know that you're really trying to make, you know, full budget, professional, powerful film. And I just can't wait to see you in the last four years working on this to get this out. DanielLustelin.com. In closing, I know you've got sources. I know a lot of it now is pretty much, as you said, last time you were on, is put out at Davos. But what's on the agenda for 2015 in Switzerland or in Austria? One of the key issues, Alex, is fiscal austerity. You know, this boogie, boogeyman term is back. It's, it's kind of a vague term that is, you know, actually refers to cutting social spending and increasing taxes. And the effect this has is that the public sector is devastated as all assets are privatized. Public workers, you know, are fired in mass. Unemployment becomes rapid. Health and education disappear. Taxes rise dramatically. And currencies are devalued to make all assets cheaper for international corporations and banks to buy up 
while internally causing inflation, dramatically increasing the costs of fuel and food. And in short, fiscal austerity implies social destruction as we're seeing right now in Greece, as we saw in Spain, as we saw in, in Portugal, and as we're seeing, you know, in, in Italy. And, you know, the social destruction of the social foundations of nations and peoples are pulled out from under them. States then become despotic and oppress the people who naturally revolt against austerity. And this is called the sterilization of society. And this is the term, again, this is the term, Alex, you're going to be seeing a lot more, you know, with the build up to Bilderberg and then post Bilderberg. We talked about this before, you know, terms like deindustrialization, zero growth, demand destruction. You know, they were discussed at these private secret meetings. And then suddenly they were front and center in major newspapers. Next big front and center newspaper piece is sterilization of society. It sounds awful. Just the world sterilization itself with all the connotations. When you start sterilizing society, it takes on a meaning of its own. It takes it, you know, to an nth degree, you know, of, of, of evil that, needless to say, we have to make sure we fight this. When they say sterilization, do they mean sterilization physically, which we know is part of their agenda, population reduction? Or does it mean kill upward mobility, stagnate, make people poor, and basically create a class society in the name of collectivism? It's more, it's, it's more, you know, meaning austerity. So as yeah. austerity hits, for example, the West, the middle class will vanish in obscurity as they will be absorbed into the lower labor-oriented working class. The youth of the Western middle class, comprising the majority of the educated youth, will be exposed to poverty of expectations in which they grew up in a world in which they were promised everything, in which these kids played by the rules, and which, you know, they got nothing from society. And the inevitability... i tell you what, Daniel, I don't want to cut you off. I know you got to go, but do five more minutes with us if you can. I'm going to twist your arm. DanielEslin.com. I want you to finish uh, up. So thank you so much on what their agenda is straight ahead and then we'll cover world news and economic news after he leaves us more with daniel eslin straight ahead i'm alex jones greece's economic meltdown and bailout what's the real story could europe be the new japan putin russia and ukraine war results of davos summit we kind of hit on that 70th anniversary of yalta conference daniel was invited to give a keynote speech for the russian government that's a big deal that was when stalin churchill uh and of course uh, the u.s president uh, at the time, he died shortly after uh, Roosevelt all met. And the post-world plan was set up. Copenhagen terrorist attack. And uh, we already talked about trans-evolution, transhumanism. Uh, but uh, he uh, joins us right now uh, from Europe. Uh, Daniel, continuing, let's, let's run through what's in store in the agenda and then these points. Maybe it was just, as we have a little time, maybe we just touch on a couple of things. One is Russia, Ukraine. And uh, the other is uh, the situation with the ECs, because it all kind of ties in with what's happening in the, you know, with deindustrialization, et cetera. I think it's, you know, it's fairly obvious when we're talking about, you know, the, the whole issue between Russia and the United States and NATO. It's not Ukraine. It's the determination of governments that are under the thumb of the London Wall Street financial oligarchy to crush any sovereign opposition to their power. And the powerful nations committed to defending national sovereignty, especially Russia and China, are thus de facto their enemies and any lies necessarily to justify that this, you know, this, this designation will be and are being used. And the truth is being overwhelmed by a torrent of lies about Russian aggression, you know, suppressing the real story of the coup d'etat in Ukraine, the Nazi nature of the coup plotters themselves, and also the strategic intentions you know, behind the plot, and we're seeing that, and it's amazing how easily the Americans can be confused and lied to and accept, you know, the propaganda of the White House and the Western elite. That's right. Uh, Copenhagen terrorist attack. You, what do you think is going on there? Well, if, you know, if, if you kind of go back, Alex, to, uh, you know, I don't know if you remember back in 2005, the famous uh, politicking cartoons. Uh, these are the first, you know, Mohammed uh, cartoons, uh, which were released in 2000 by this uh, Dutch, uh, Danish, sorry, uh, newspaper called the uh, Hot JT Politiken. So out of the guise of free speech, this newspaper, you know, they published a dozen provocative anti-Islamic cartoons clearly designed to offend the Muslims. We've seen this again with uh, Charlie Hebdo. We're seeing it right now, what's going on in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Denmark. You know, but if you kind of look at, the, at what's going on, all these characters, whether it's Sarkozy's, Cheney's, Rumsfeld, Netanyahu's, Jack Straw's, Obama's, Bush's, 
All of these people that march into the you know, martial music of the neocons, that the shock troops of the clash of civilizations, project for new American century, the long war, clean break, and all these other neocon plots, conspiracies, and contrivances. And once again, the question is, who benefits? You know, enters the equation. Muslims, you know, they may burn off some of the outrage of what they see as denigration, you know, of the religion. But at the end of the day, the Straussian, you know, Habotinsky liquidite coalition, they score some very big propaganda points. And once again, people in America and Europe who must be periodically reminded of the necessity for this clash of civilizations, agenda for total war, are incensed by the violence spreading across the Middle East, and are convinced that all Muslims are crazed fanatics who must ultimately be dealt with and put to death. And so when you kind of look at it from that perspective, you, say, you ask yourself, you know, who wins? Well, this is the situation. And it's going back, putting all these things, you know, from a bird's eye view into perspective, you know, ISIS, Ukraine, deindustrialization in America, what's going on? Well, we, know, we all know what ISIS is. But, you know, with this fingertip control of the world's oil supplies, ISIS is holding the economies and hence the governments of Western Europe and Japan hostage to the same policy. And with its networks of mullahs and kooks distributed throughout the Middle East, it is threatening the Arab world with the hell of more Iran, you know, if Arab governments do not play along with the Islamic card and seize their aspirations for industrial development. But again, these people are not new. ISIS, we saw this with the Muslim Brothers going back seven years. It's the same thing as Al-Qaeda. This is a very old strategy for at least 150 years, Alex. It has been the strategy of the British and later the Anglo-Americans to make use of the religious and tribal backwardness of the nations of the near Middle East and Central Asia in order to control the people of the area and to maintain them in a state of underdevelopment. It has recently become obvious you know, that we've seen years back in the 1990s with Big New Brzezinski's book, you know, it has been sold on the idea that the Muslim fundamentalists, if properly guided, can be useful toy, you know, for the Anglo-American strategies of bulwark against anything that has to do with progress and development. And what's amazing and about listening to you, Daniel Estelin, is that you're quoting here from Brzezinski's book, you're quoting from the Grand Chessboard, you're quoting from the great game that the British talked about in India where they would tr play different Indian tribes off against each other. How could you have one British on average conquer over 2,000 Indians with just a few thousand? It was using sociology to play different groups off. And so the globalists fund the radical Muslims, turn them loose, so it is a real issue. It is disgusting what they're doing. But then they open the borders, bring them in, let them attack, then take our liberties, and then go and take over and kill the innocent Muslims in mass. This is the globalist manipulating all sides against each other uh, and, and then writing books about their grand strategy. Uh, and, and the public needs to wake up to this and needs to understand it. Daniel, uh, folks can follow you on Twitter. Uh, what's the best Twitter account for them to follow you at? It's at Estel and Daniel. Also, uh, as I said, the documentary is just about to be done. And I don't know if I mentioned, I don't think I did, but I was recently nominated for Nobel Peace Prize for all the work I have done over the years in fighting this globalist elite. So again, I think there's a lot of recognition being done and made on the world stage, not only for the things that I do, but also for this, again, for this change of consciousness sure. in society. You know, which is going towards this greater collective good, which is actually what we need, you know, to actually defeat these people, defeat the elitists, and have a better future for our children. Well said. God bless you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you, Alex, so much for being on your show. Absolutely. Uh, again, Daniel's uh, books have sold uh, number one bestseller in more than 15 countries. And a lot of Americans wouldn't know who he is. A lot of folks in Europe and Asia know who he is. It just shows how many great people there are out there fighting tyranny. And he's taken action. He's got a film coming out. That makes me feel good knowing there's more people out there fighting, not just myself or our listeners.